Hello, this is HRG Lucius K and this is the Native Intelligence Dialogue TV channel. On our session uh, today, we will be focusing on my spiritual journey. As I've indicated in our premiere that uh, we'll kick off our discussions by way of uh, me taking you into my confidence about uh, my spiritual journey which started off in 1976 when I was five. That was the first time that uh, I got my first ancestral visitation. It was an old lady whom I had not known. She, she just uh, drew a chair and sat next to me by my bedside. She told me not to be scared and that uh, she had a message for me to take to my parents and uh, the message was that um, I should uh, tell my parents not to take me to school because uh, they had plans for me and then she disappeared so <laughs> as with uh, most families we had chores my brothers and I uh, it was my week to make tea for my parents. So around 6 a.m. when it was bright outside, I went into the main house uh, to prepare the tray and I took it to the master bedroom. And then I got there to, to my parents that uh, a certain old lady uh, came to visit me and uh, she had a message to pass on to them and uh, my father found it very funny uh, he just laughed his lungs out and uh, uh, with his uh, chitric background he uh, probably just saw one of his <laughs> patients <laughs> and uh, he just basically made fun of me to say yeah an old lady visited you, and uh, what did she say? And then uh, I told them the message, and then uh, my mother then I stepped in to say, can you describe her? I described her, and immediately after I described her, she said, ah, the Koko Paki, it was Koko Paki. And uh, my father, stunned, said, uh, Hey, when? Where did you know Kuku Paki from? Because you were still a bigger name when she passed on. And uh, the funny thing about it all is that uh, it's ironical. He acknowledged that my description of the old lady that visited me uh, fitted the description of uh, Koko Paki, but uh, he did not want to um, acknowledge the message. He said, uh, I went to school, how do I not take a child to school? How do I explain to the community why I'm not taking a child to school? And he said, hey, look, Koshi. That's what he called me, Koshi. Hey, look, Koshi. Um, in the world, there are so many people with many opinions. Uh, so, don't mess yourself up with everything that you hear and uh, uh, disturbs you. So, Tsela, King Mwefela. Jesus Christ, just go to church and uh, focus on being a good boy and you'll have a good life. Otherwise, you meet a lot of people who tell you a lot of things. Some will tell you that there's salvation at the top of that mountain there and you'll set about to get to that mountain and halfway that mountain you'll meet others going down and they tell you 
uh, we can see that you are going up there you are on the right mission but this is not the right mountain you come from there and uh, the right mountain is that one and each time they tell you that you drop money so forget about all that and just focus on being a good boy so he was uh, of a strong christian background and he would not hear anything of it and that decided it i was never to raise that kind of matter with him stories about uh, visitations at night they're just dreams they uh, forget about all those things so it was my mother who had a sympathetic ear and uh, listened every time I had those visitations. And uh, when we went back home uh, at that Richville to visit our relatives, my mother and I visited Rakadi, my father's older sister, to say, look, um, actually, the eldest sister to say, look, this is what I'm faced with at home and uh, my husband is not ready to listen. What do I do? Because the child is not sleeping. Uh, he's uh, having a lot of problems at night and all these ancestral visitations and uh, Rakadi said, no man, uh, forget that one, you know, you know him. He's headstrong and he's not going to change his mind about this. I'll take you to Mami Lodi, to uh, a friend of mine who will assist the boy. And uh, every time you have this kind of issues, you must go to Mami Lodi. She was located somewhere at... Uh, SNS in Mamelodi East. So we visited Mamelodi East, and uh, the old lady uh, threw her bones and uh, she told me straight out that uh, I was the chosen one. And I asked the chosen one to do what? And he said, uh, she just laughed and said, you know, to do the work that I'm doing. And I asked her, what work are you doing? <laughs> and then she said to me, look, uh, to help people, you know. But uh, don't worry about that. Uh, you'll understand when you are older. And uh, it is through you that your family will be saved. Saved from what? No, don't worry about all that. It will be clearer as you grow older. So I got a whole lot of all those visitations and uh, my situation didn't change. So because uh, we were among the first residents at Lwakomo Township when it was established, my parents did not have anyone to look after me when they went to work. And uh, two of my older brothers went to school at the nearby village, Lawari uh, Ngamau, Rampakele. So that was when Little Bedford View Primary School was launched, and uh, the school principal there and my father were acquainted because my father was the first secretary of the school committee and he asked that they take me to school albeit I was not of school going age so that uh, I could uh, have someone to go <laughs> when everybody else went everywhere else so I got everything books, uniform, went to sub A. 
Only I was not registered as a pupil. And then I created problems for them because I passed very well. And uh, created uh, a problem for the school because I was not registered as a pupil and uh, the department did not know about my existence. So my class teacher, Mrs. Rosina Mpachel, uh, approached uh, my parents with uh, the vice principal, Mrs. Uh, Irene Moloto, both late, to take my parents uh, into their confidence about this challenge to say, hey, this boy um, got us into trouble because he passed very well and he's not in the books. So uh, how do we do? How do we handle this matter? And uh, my father said, uh, you are the teachers. You can advise us on how to handle this matter. I said, no. Mrs. Mbathele said, uh, if this boy repeats sub A, he will turn out to be a bullet because he's a bright chap. And my father said, no, you, you are the parents of the child at school. You know what's best. Let's do it. So the challenge was how to tell me that I was not proceeding to sub B without me feeling that I was being punished for something. So they basically explained to me that, uh, look, because you were too young and uh, you were not supposed to be in school, now you are of age, you are now going to school. I was distraught, but uh, I had no say in the matter. And then... Uh, I started off again with Sabe. And then uh, as time went on, the teachers started frequenting my place to say, but Mr. Kutumela, what are you doing with this child? What are you doing? And he got annoyed to say, what do you want me to do with this? What do you want me to do? <laughs> I mean, he's a child. No, but this child is different. This child uh, has got an ability to understand things that are far ahead of his uh, age, you know. So, but what am I to do? <laughs> He's a child. It happened so many times. And then I got out of uh, Standard 5. I proceeded to Lubakomo High School. Then at six, then at seven, and then uh, a new school was established, Matomomayo Secondary School. We called it Soviet because uh, that was around the mid 80s, at the height of the state of emergency and uh, uprisings, political uprisings. So I was taken to Soviet, and then I got involved in. Uh, community activities. I had a, a youth club, fame youth club, and then later Club Tropicana, and uh, we participated in SABC TV3 and SABC TV2 channels. Uh, they had variety programs, La Polo Radio and uh, we were rendering items there for money and uh, gaining exposure to Live outside Le Boakomo, interacting with a whole lot of cultural groups from everywhere else in the PWV area. And uh, my parents got worried because uh, I was getting too involved in the old bank classes. So to go home and steal the phone to phone La Poloha to wait to bid for auditions and so on. So they made arrangements. Uh, with the Tareta uh, Senior Secondary School at Makurung Rampachele, Stitavanen Makurung, then Ultra Rural Community School outside of Lubuakum to go uh, 
to standard measure 10 upon completion thereof uh, there were challenges at home in the sense that uh, my eldest brother was uh, a dentistry student at Medwinsa and uh, it so happened that uh, there was uh, some corruption going on in the Department of Health in the former Lebua government in the sense that uh, funds were released in his name to pay for his school fees at Medunza, but uh, the funds were paying for someone else so that upon completion he services the, the account. So when I completed my matric and I, I needed to go forward with my tertiary education, he was uh, doing course four of uh, BCHD, Bachelor of Surgical Dentistry. And uh, the authorities at the university then uh, contacted my parents to say, look, um, your son's account is in arrears. In fact, he has not paid his, pay, his fees since course one. And uh, now we're going to have to cut him off until his account is settled. And um, that brought a lot of uh, frustration in the family. Uh, my brother argued that uh, how do you proceed from course one to course four without uh, your account being serviced. I mean, you get your mail card, you get your resident, you get your residence, you get your tuition, you get your registration, and unless those are, are paid, you do not proceed to the next academic year. And here I'm at course four. How does that happen? They said, uh, settle the account first and argue later. So uh, the funds that were set aside for me to pursue my legal career, aspired for legal career, uh, with Standard General, had to be channeled towards servicing the account. And so I was told uh, I could not go forward for the next two years because uh, my parents would be assisting my eldest brother. And, uh, he had to get a job while well, that was done. So, well, I just hung around dancing a lot <laughs> at La Polo and then 1990 came and uh, I offered uh, myself at uh, the ANC's regional headquarters at Mimosa Building in uh, former Petersburg, working. Uh, in the office of uh, Mr. Brian Molefe, who taught me a lot about everything I know about uh, the office administration, uh, how to write business letters, how to communicate with the uh, various structures of uh, the ANC and uh, arranging, helping to arrange funerals, mass funerals, and all those things. So that uh, Come 1994, a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine, Mr. Joseph Mpia, um, was uh, appointed as a candidate trust officer at the APSA Trust Private Banking and Investments Limited in Pretoria Specialized Legal Services Division of APSA Bank uh, as one of the chairman's uh, protege projects where they were testing ground on uh, introducing black people into the fold, understanding that uh, the winds of change were blowing and uh, it was either the company waited for legislation to force them to embrace change or they should just uh, do it on their own. So, fortunately, Joe performed very well, that was in 1994, and they approached him to say, look, 
uh, we want you to recommend at least three of your colleagues from university so that you can interview them along with others for a post that's opened uh, for next year, 95. Joe recommended three of his buddies from Varsity and then uh, he recommended that uh, they interview me also for the post, but uh, warned them that I was an undergraduate. But uh, whatever they did before they make a decision, they would uh, speak to me and uh, make a decision after speaking with me. And that caught their curiosity. And I was invited for an interview, but uh, preparing for that interview, what I did was to then uh, approach the late uh, Mr. Manoto Shikwani from Habakkuk Ken Furniture. As they, one of their subsidiaries there was the Winners Toyota and asked him to write me a, toast, a testimonial. So uh, he was very fond of me. He called me handsome boy. He said, uh, write it the way you want it, handsome boy. And then uh, I did that. He asked his secretary to type it. And then uh, he just signed it on his letterhead. Manoto Shikwani, dealer principal, Toyota, the winners, the winners Toyota. And then I approached uh, uh, my Sunday school teacher, uh, Professor Emeritus Kartler. S.T. Carter and asked him to prepare a, a testimonial for me. He obliged me and then uh, I approached uh, Advocate uh, Rasefate, who was uh, Deputy Director General in the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development at the time. And uh, he gave me a match <laughs> because he argued that uh, he did not meet the criteria of the people that I described were eligible to prepare that testimonial for me and asked me why I thought he was suitable and I told him that because you've got influence. But what kind of influence are you talking about? I mean, you're a deputy director general. You've got a whole lot of people reporting to you. And then he said, no, no, I only have four people reporting to me. Said, yeah, but uh, there are those that report to those that report to you. So you've got a lot of influence and I want you to write that uh, testimonial for me. And uh, he was annoyed with me. He was visibly annoyed <laughs> because I was disturbing his uh, jogging. You know, along Struven Street, I just bumped into him jogging and I stopped him and I told him that I wanted him <laughs> to do that. I said, okay, come tomorrow at my office. I'll see what I can do for you. And that's how I got uh, a testimonial from him. I asked my brother to buy me a suit and a tie, new shoes, spirvet and shop shirt. And then uh, I did not have a CV. Mamilodi West, my uncle, Mr. Masangu, is late now. Uh, right opposite in Gazi Garage, uh, for those who know Mamilodi. Um, I approached him to say, look, I've got an interview on Monday. It was a Friday afternoon, about 3 p.m., and I don't have a CV. Do you, do you have it? Written, handwritten, he said yes. And then he picked up the phone and called one local school, primary school. And then he asked them to type this uh, CV for me. I've got a young man here, he's an impressionable young man. He's got an interview, a job interview on Monday. And they said, no, 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 it's late now. We're knocking off, said no. But do you want this thing hanging over your head? 
that the young boy's future is ruined because you are rushing home as teachers. I have to speak with your authorities about this matter and then I said it was not necessary. Send the boy over. That's how my CV was typed. Monday morning, nine o'clock, I was at Upset Trust. It was not Upset Trust uh, at the time. Um, it was Folks Gas Trust on the corner of uh, Van der Waal and Pretoria Streets, the 27th floor. So it was still Folks Gas building, Folks Gas Bank building at the time. And uh, when I got there, I was interviewed. But I was not one to wait for anyone to ask me questions. I had my own questions tabulated. And uh, so I just fired away. <laughs> I started asking them questions. And I had read the Sunday Times. And uh, uh, on the Sunday Times, uh, it was uh, intimated that uh, Standard Bank had lost a government account and it was won by uh, FNB. No, no, Absa, Absa Bank had lost the account and it was won by Standard Bank and so on. So I had such questions as uh, what plans did they have? <laughs> <laughs> to make certain that this kind of thing never happened again. And um, what kind of plans did they have uh, for transformation in line with the RTP, the Reconstruction and Development Plan, and so on. So I was just asking questions like that. And uh, they did not ask me any question at all. Um, Mr. Boyfesser, who was the original branch manager, just picked up the phone and called the office manager, Mrs. Elmarie de Puyer, to say, um, call all the other candidates and uh, cancel the appointments. And that was how I was appointed. I was appointed on the spot. And I was taken round the office and I was asked not to try and change everything overnight. <laughs> well, we talk about my experiences uh, in, in that environment in another session now. Um, we had two companies that uh, we gave work to. Um, our division, uh, estates department, uh, a division that is up to Trust Private Banking and Investments Limited, we drafted wills, we administered deceased estates, we administered trusts, but I was in the estates department, so we um, outsourced work to those two firms and quarterly they took us out on excursions um, and on one of those excursions of course the first of my excursions there with them we went to RTBS Port uh, the Key West and the Cosmos were still under development at the time and they had two big big boats no, ones with two propellers, uh, one on either side. And, uh, well, I was happy hanging out the ladies there in their bikinis and so was uh, a bride there and the guys were water skiing and doing all manner of uh, water sport and I was just happy in my... Uh, you know, swim trunks and uh, having uh, the time of my life uh, <laughs> flanked by beautiful uh, ladies there. 
and uh, after downing a few beers there uh, they convinced me to try water ski <laughs> uh, i agreed um, it was a tube a big round tube and then it had two handles at the fore and two handles on the sides and uh, I was told that uh, I must sit inside the tube and hand, and uh, hold on to the handles on the sides. And uh, when the boat changed direction, I was not going to feel the effect immediately. And uh, it usually does that. Uh, abruptly and uh, if I cannot handle that uh, pressure I must not hold on tight to the handles I must leave them and then uh, because I'm wearing a lifesaver jacket I would not drown well we had just come out of a drought season in Mbobo when we were uh, <laughs> having uh, that yellow maize meal uh, it was during that time so you take a, a boy from Lewowa and you put him in a lot of water he's never seen a lot of water before you know when he comes from a drought stricken environment <laughs> so and no one could convince me not to hold on tight to those handles <laughs> when, the, when the boat changed direction I just kept on holding on tight and uh, I broke my left arm and I was not aware that it was broken because I was a bit tipsy um, so I was dunked because I was tiny pint sized and uh, you know African guys are tall and big so they didn't have a lifesaver jacket to fit <laughs> a pine sized man <laughs> so they had extra extra large so i went under and uh, i tried to take the, the lifesaver jacket got off my neck and uh, as i was going down I tried to lift up the left silver jacket to the back of my neck with my left arm, but it was not responsive. I could not tell that it was broken because I was tipsy. I got tired of it and I decided to take a nap. And that was the significance of the moment because uh, as I decided to take a nap, I had a big loud voice in my chest. It was the first time I had that voice. It was my maternal grand, my, sorry, my paternal grandmother, Coco Mamaloko Maria Gudumela, who said, uh, If you fall asleep, my son, you will drown. Try your right hand side. I tried my right hand side, it responded. I just hugged it on to the back of my neck and poof, shot right up. They just saw the legs and then the head. Does it? Does it? And they come rushing. But to uh, the amazement of everyone, I had not taken even a drop of water. Uh, they beat me up my chin oh, on my cheeks and uh, on my tongue thinking that uh, for the time that I was underwater I must have taken a few gallons <laughs> but uh, I had taken none not a drop and they just kept on asking me calling out to me Lucius, Lucius, can you see me? yes I can see you they thought I was under shock and denial and they kept on slapping me and until they realized that uh, I was 
was fine. And then uh, I was taken to HF Revolt. And upon examination, they found that uh, there was a, a bit of alcohol in my system. <laughs> Just a bit. It would be also. <laughs> and I said, no, we can't do anything with uh, the quantity of alcohol in his uh, bloodstream. They took some wheelchair there <laughs> with three wheels and uh, I had to balance it with one leg. <laughs> As I stood there and it was raining and it was cold and they just took my vest and made an arm sling. And, uh, I was just waiting for the alcohol content to drop and uh, around I got there at around 11 a.m. then around 5 p.m. that's when they took me to Acacia clinic and uh, um, I underwent uh, orthopedic surgery and uh, the significance of that incident was uh, first encounter with my paternal grandmother, Koko Mamuloko. And much later, when uh, I had gone through all this career, uh, uh, you know, developments, taking up a whole lot of challenges in the corporate world, entrepreneurship, uh, traveling abroad and uh, clenching deals overseas and doing wonders in the field of entrepreneurship. She approached me again in 2012 to say, uh, look, when I was in the world, I was in Tarnaru <laughs> Rufi lechele de or opete did I was a rail. Then on way now, it's a rail. Chelete Utsamega Gayana Levasita Kichelet and its own zero to zero opete did I was a rail. It's a lay I won't hollow. Kids lay to her. Maroka Cotel Bona Morahem or his opinion legos a cruel Satab. ဝါနာရကောင်းဘူးစေတာဒီလိုစေရိုစေချင်းဆိုတာဆိုတော့ခင်မခအလေခေါ်လို့ဒီလိုအိုလင်မွန်နာအိလေရှာတာဆရာစ
because I had some deals that I was putting together, uh, major deals. Department of Labor had just gotten a 10 billion rand a deal of a period of 10 years and uh, I was to secure with my company at least uh, 490 million rand only on license fees uh, under the auspices of uh, Siemens Business Services. So I was dealing with those kind of contracts and tried to negotiate that uh, we had enough time home. I started losing money inexplicably. Uh, contracts and my Canadian partners just withdrew the license. A technology license. I had a, an exclusive master license agreement for the entire continent of Africa in the enterprise application integration space. So, without that license, my company was a shell company. So, I realized that uh, this was serious. I packed up a sports bag, threw it in my car trunk. Limbobo, Limbobo, and I was broke. I don't know what happened to my money. I just don't know what happened to my money. I was broke. And when I got home, my father could see that this chap is not, <laughs> he's not fluid anymore. <laughs> um, apparently, he took my mother to the side that this guy is not having it nice, so do not let on that we could see. We can see that uh, he's not fine. I just want to teach him a few lessons that uh, in life it is important for you to humble yourself, to ask for help when things are not going fine. So it took me a few weeks to gather up the courage to approach my father and say to him I needed help. And he was surprised when I approached him to say, hey, Papa, I have a big problem. Yes, I need to go to Johannesburg to go fetch my furniture and everything else. Um, so what is the problem? I cannot afford to hire a truck to go there. I said, oh, no, no, it's not a problem. Just talk to, just, just talk to people and let me know how much they want uh, for you to go get that stuff. No third degree, no question. It was like he was expecting me to approach him and he almost seemed very happy that I approached him. I was confused because I, I was expecting a third degree or some, you know? Because he was not happy in the first instance when I left Absa Trust. He said he was spoiled and how could I lose a, leave a job like that in this environment of unemployment and you get such an opportunity and ah, ah, ah. And I thought I was going to get something like that and he said no, no. I just talk to people and tell me how much they want and I got a truck and I got a, a trailer, went to Johannesburg, got all my stuff back home and um, that was March and then May 6, 2012, he passed on. How he passed on would be a matter for another session. And then um, I was the last to be with him when he passed on by his bedside. Events there by his bedside. Another session for that. And uh, when I rose to leave uh, upon
on 15 hours uh, elapsing I said Papa uh, Salo Rovala Bill and then I was struck by the way he responded you know so his strong voice was back that's right then I turned around to look at him and I was surprised why would he respond to with such force but I made nothing of it and then I proceeded to the door and when I got to the door a large voice in my chest said stop and turn around and as I stopped to turn around another even louder voice said don't stop Proceed. Go on. And then I proceeded. Only to find that that was when he was gasping. And I was saved from seeing him gasp. So it was 8 o'clock. We got home. My mother and I. And then 10 o'clock. The phone rings. My mother answers the phone. And then she goes into... A frantic mood. Hey, Mingi. Parapapa clock of it. I was just with him. They must have done something to him. So she said, no, no. How do you say they did something to him? When they told you that they were going to take someone that you love very much from you. And that counted for therapy that I couldn't have gotten anywhere else because remembering that helped me understand what was going on I snapped out of it and we were able to prepare for the funeral and uh, that was me January 2013, on the 19th, it was a Saturday at 4 a.m. There was a funeral of a fellow congregant who resided at Khampahlele. And I got up um, at 4 a.m. to switch on the geyser so that we can start preparing, taking baths and all at 5 a.m. So I switched on the geyser, the, the geyser sorry, and then... Um, Upon going back to bed, um, I realized I had my PC, my laptop, my notebook. I just took it to the side, to the bedside uh, table, only to find it was uh, only instinctual and it helped out a lot. Because 15 minutes later, it was almost like an earthquake. Go, 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 go. Sound that I couldn't tell what it was. It was uh, to find that it was uh, a Mercedes Benz which had landed on top of the roof and it was driving on top of the roof to land in the master bedroom and uh, power was out. And uh, a loud voice in my chest once again just said, jump! I jumped out of bed. And as I was jumping the wall that divided the master bedroom uh, from mine, just uh, fell on top of my headboard, destroying it entirely. It was a wooden uh, headboard. And my mother started screaming, asking for me to come and rescue her because there was something at the door and she could not get out and uh, lightning had struck the house. And then when she said lightning had struck the house and uh, there was something that blocked the door and she couldn't get out and uh, she was suffocating she cannot she could not breathe i thought it was something some living organism lightning blocking the door I, my mind thought it was some baboon or something so switched on 
in the light of my phone and uh, found my way through the passage and some reception area just before I got into the master bedroom and there was this big steel thing with glass I couldn't tell what it was my mind was set on this thing being a living organism because lightning had struck the house and nothing said to me that this is the thing that was blocking the house that is the door and uh, only to find that it was the Mercedes Benz, the top of the Mercedes Benz, lay, which lay uh, sideways to block the, the door. And uh, I had to go and phone around. And when I got outside, a lot of people were gathered, neighbors who had had a loud bang. That was the beginning of uh, my responding to my ancestor, ancestral calling. Uh, that was not an accident. That was a car that was uh, hijacked by agents of uh, darkness or the dark underworld. They just lulled the young driver, the 14-year-old boy, to sleep. They took control of the car so they could get um, their uh, instruments of the dark underworld into my home, uh, airborne. So those are details we got to learn the later stage. Suffice it to say for now that uh, the house was uh, declared uh, no longer suitable for human habitation so we resided in the uh, outside rooms, the cottage house outside and uh, that was January, it was only in April that uh, as things developed I got to realize that I had to go for uh, my training as a practitioner of traditional medicine and spiritual healing and what kick-started that was my mother and I sitting around in the cottage house it was around 8 p.m. And we were feeling pity for ourselves, saying, um, ever since Papa died, none of our relatives, no one, had ever even called to say, how are you? You know? And we were just left on our own. And they left immediately after the funeral. And we were just feeling pity for ourselves. And as we were doing that, we had a sound of uh, like uh, a rod, you know, a walking stick of an old person um, struck thrice on the floor. Go, go, go. And then I was happy. I thought maybe it's the ancestors saying, stop worrying about earthly people. They will always disappoint you. We are here for you. And that gave us a lot of comfort. But when I fell asleep, they told me I was mistaken. That was not uh, a rod. It was kika. I don't know what it is in English. Kika. That is uh, the instrument we use to crush herbs. It signified that I had to go for ancestral calling. They would show me exactly where to go. And that's how it all started. And they showed me where to go uh, for the first time. So, in a nutshell, um, that is what transpired. 
as a way leading up to my taking up my training as a practitioner of traditional medicine for the first two years in 2013 to 2015 and then later taking up induction into this into divinity in the spiritual realm but uh, of importance is that a whole lot of important aspects were left out of my presentation uh, but we'll go back to those issues as we go along there's so much to cover and uh, we'll have a whole lot of these sessions for now you know the drill subscribe like share and comment because it is when you comment that uh, the conversation will uh, start rolling we need to reach as many people as can be because uh, there are people out there who have experienced certain things and they don't know what to do with those things and they don't even know at times that their experience is worth noting so hearing this kind of uh, testimonials um, will help uh, those that are encountering them and they don't know what is happening to them and how to deal with those things so these sessions are intended to assist humanity understand humanity better hrg lucius k the native intelligence dialogue tv channel let's engage cheerio